recording. Uh, oh, geez, that was going to be a weird loop. All right, we are ready to go. Um, we are resuming our Tech Tuesdays. And today we are doing assistive technology for mutual support and recovery with Norm, the one and only Norm Delisle. We are so lucky to have him here today. <laughs> um, so I will start off saying uh, my name and my uh, description. So my name is Abby Squires and I will be the chat moderator moderator today. Um, anything you put in the chat, any questions or comments, I will read aloud to Norm for him so he can focus on his presentation. Also, I want to let everyone know that we have captioning, live captioning today. So at the bottom of your screen, if you want to click on those, that caption button, if you need any help, just let me know. Um, and if at any time you do want to comment or ask a question, you can feel free to unmute um, or type in the chat. Um, and a physical description of myself is I am a white woman of size. Today I'm wearing dark rim glasses, a black shirt and a black hoodie. My hair is dark brown up in a messy bun and my background is a cluttered office. And I will pass it over to Norm. Thanks, Abby. Um, my name is Norm Delisle. I, I work for Michigan Disability Rights Coalition 30 hours a week. I've been around uh, um, disability community all my life, actually, but I've been working in it as a, at least a little bit of an advocate since 1970. Um, I'm a white man. I'm wearing a, a black or gray baseball cap, and I have a t-shirt on that says, disability rights are human rights. And the background is, a, is from the Lake Superior, and it shows waves crashing on the shore. Um, Mostly in the disability community, everybody gets that assistive technology is available for physical disabilities and uh, neurological disabilities, that sort of thing. But assistive technology has become available over the last decade to support personal recovery. And um, the key to understanding why you would use assistive technology in any context is that personal control is personal power. It's not against assistance from people, uh, not against uh, programs that support. Um, it's a, but it is true that anything you can do yourself, you have more control over than if you, if you must have someone else help you do it. And this is just as true for the areas we're going to talk about today as it is for any other. I want to focus on three areas in which assistive technology can be uh, genuinely useful in supporting real community inclusion for people with mental illness, substance use disorders, and developmental disabilities. One is AT to support emotional self-regulation. Uh, the second is AT to support executive functions, which I'll talk about later in the presentation. And the last one that's often left off the, the table is assistive technology to support personal safety. Um, the, uh, where did it go? There we go. If you have any questions, put them in chat. It's just easier for me. I, um, I am not a person who does nearly as well with things I hear as things I read. Although Abby is very, very good at doing uh, work with stuff that she hears. If I can't get to your question today, I'll review those in the chat box and answer them by email if you give me your email address. And I will write all those down for you and then I can send them to you after. Okay. Um, the MDRC mission. MDRC cultivates disability pride and strengthens the disability movement by recognizing disability as a natural and beautiful part of human diversity while collaborating to dismantle all forms of oppression. This is a very different and far more inclusive and expansive mission than we had when I started at MDRC in 1997. And it reflects the learning and deepened understanding that the organization has developed over the last, uh, um, uh, well, gee, how many years? 25, almost 25 years. Just a couple. <laughs> yeah. Um, assistive technology is any item, piece of equipment, software, or app 
that is used to help people with disabilities, including older adults, do what they want to do. And so it's a very broad definition. And uh, it, we often forget that in thinking about what, say, Medicaid will pay for, as opposed to what we might use because it enables us to have more independence. Technology is a general part of our larger society can make things easier for everyone. Um, for people with disabilities, assistive technology opens up possibilities. And this is just as true of assistive technology that's used for mutual support and recovery as it is for any other. One of the issues that comes up with uh, uh, AT is how you go about deciding which what it is that you want. In the old days, when you had a choice between a manual chair and the absolutely simplest power chair that was available, you could it was relatively easy to make a, a choice. But today, um, there is an enormous amount of uh, of everything. And, uh, and the, um, in particular, when I first started putting together a list of apps that were useful for supporting uh, people with uh, mental illness, substance use disorders, and developmental disabilities, there were very few choices. They were very mechanical. Um, they were basically experiments. And uh, that's not true anymore. So choosing AT becomes uh, an exercise in personal choice all by itself. There's a set of heuristics or rules of thumb for choosing a, an assistive technology device. The first one is to start with a personal goal. It has to be something that's meaningful to you. You are the expert on your life. And uh, so when you choose something as a personal goal, you're, you're starting out from the best possible place, your understanding of your life and yourself. The second thing is to research device and app options and take your time doing that. There's no problem, especially for uh, free programs. Some of the ones that I talk about today are free and some aren't. But uh, if they aren't free, you should look carefully to see whether there's a free trial because for the most part there is. And if it's something that is a device, um, I was thinking, for example, of there's a there's a band that you put around your head to do uh, uh, transcranial uh, stimulation. If I wouldn't pay that for that without a trial because it's not cheap. There's also an issue, and this is uh, important for anyone who wants support for almost anything, is to understand the immediate environment of the use of the assistive technology for personal care and personal support, you are the expert. If you're gonna be using it out in the community, you might wanna take some time to make sure that it's genuinely useful out there in the community. And uh, the last one is to review your resources, uh, financial, friends and family, set up an installation, programs that might help. If there's a warranty, how you would get it repaired if it's a device. Um, it's true of your phone. It should be equally true for any other form of assistive technology that you use. I want to talk for a minute about the context of inclusion. Inclusion isn't something that you just do. It's uh, something that actually occurs in the real world. And we, as members of the disability community, are well aware of of situations in which inclusion is supposed to be possible, but it isn't. Uh, one of the uh, dimensions of that is uh, when we're talking about inclusion that we need to enable what I would call reliably supported personal agency. That means that it's your call, it's your choice, um, and it's reliable. And one of the one of the issues that comes up in AT um, especially in the larger support system that we're realizing right now with the COVID pandemic. There are a great many things that were reliable before the pandemic started that are no longer reliable. Um, we mentioned, uh, someone mentioned childcare earlier. Uh, that's certainly an, uh, an important thing. There's always been issues about reliability in childcare, but they've become monumental in the current environment. There's also issues about uh, the availability of personal assistance. 
if you can find assistive technology that will actually support what you want to do, that's a, one of the uh, great things about AT that's involved with apps is, is that they're available when you need them. I put in the secret world of weather as a link because uh, there are, there's a, we all know that when we look at the weather report in the morning that the, uh, that we can't guarantee that the, that the rain is going to occur or not, or snow is going to occur or not. The Secret World of Weather is a book about how you can determine what the weather is going to be like in the short term where you are right now. And that's the kind of reliably supported personal agency that you want with an app. You want it to be there when you need it and you want it to work. Uh, one of the things that, um, this is not a simple concept, but it's an important one. <clears throat> we tend to think about uh, the uh, possibilities for us in the larger world as being, I push this button and something happens, but there's, there's a, a concept called a possibility space, which is not a fence that encloses reduced opportunity, like say uh, a support agency might be where you hire someone, but where there are possibilities that you can, you know how to use some of them and you can learn how to use others. And thinking of the world as a possibility space is, is an example of uh, a way of dealing with the real world. And the example I've included is a, is a great uh, three minute video by uh, Dave Snowden about how you organize a children's party and the difference between trying to control the outcomes of a children's party and living with the possibilities of a children's party. It's very funny. Um, there's a, a distinction out there in the world that I have never seen applied inside the disability community, but if you really want to support personal choice, we need not frameworks like an accessibility, but we need scaffolds. The scaffold is a way to engage with, say, a building, for example, uh, when you're trying to build it from the ground up. We want scaffolds, not frameworks, and the best apps are scaffolds and not just apps that give you information or solutions or something along those lines. These days, uh, mutual support of all kinds is done remotely um, as well as in person, and it seems to fluctuate from month to month whether it's a good idea to have in-person uh, support or not. And so some of the apps, which are not necessarily uh, able to provide you with information themselves, are ones that allow you to engage with other people. Remote conferencing is what we're using right now. Audio communication, you know, phone support has been around since there were phones. The very first thing that Alexander uh, Bell asked for was his assistant to come in, in the room to help him after he set up a little phone connection between the two rooms. Texting and group support texting is uh, very commonly used uh, between friends to get support. And it's also can be done with groups. It doesn't have to be just one individual texting to another. <clears throat> and there's a whole string of uh, async, what they call asynchronous communication systems like Discord and Slack and a zillion others, one of which I have absolutely no ability to use is called TikTok. But there are an awful lot of them out there, and there are so many that what you really need to do is find the one that you find comfortable in its use. And uh, then you can use it to support and look for people who uh, 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 can participate in your inclusive efforts and provide the kind of support that you need. The real point of AT is not the device, it's being, being able to engage with the world the way you want to do it. And uh, as you use assistive technology, you're building a coherent interaction over time. This helps you once you have these things set up and you're used to using them, it helps you to build uh, ways of dealing with the uncertainty in life if there's anybody left who thinks that life is certain. 
You'll note that there's a link at the bottom of the page that's named resources page of apps and information. That link is on a variety of slides across the presentation and um, Abby's going to put it into the chat uh, so you can trigger it that way if you want to. This is a, a Google Docs that's open to anyone who has the link. And it contains what I found for a variety of things, but specifically for the three areas where um, that we're going to talk about today. And um, it's a big document with a lot of links, and it needs to be taken in small doses. If you know what you're looking for, you can try the immediate topic category. But if you're not sure, just kind of look through it. When you see something interesting, take a look at that. And uh, eventually, you'll find something that you can use um, that will be of actual help to you. Uh, recovery is a, a complicated concept that's been around in the mental illness community and the substance use disorder community for probably two decades as a, something that everyone is aware of. But uh, the, the word recovery was chosen by those communities because it reflected their way of dealing with the realities of the disabilities that they were uh, trying to manage. In my view, recovery is the personal management of barriers to your choices through effort, learning, habit building, effective rituals, natural supports, and the tools available through support systems, including AT. So recovery is about an individual being able to manage those parts of their lives that are preventing them from living the kind of life they want and uh, in their natural support community. And one of the ways in which you get natural supports is through the use of apps and assistive technology. So I think recovery is a very natural uh, concept for the use of apps, but it hasn't really been thought of that way until fairly recently. The first category I want to talk about is emotional self-regulation. Um, oftentimes, especially after trauma, the ability to, to manage emotions becomes uh, disjointed and it and, uh, can take a very long time to uh, produce the kind of control that you perhaps you once had before the trauma occurred. I have PTSD from combat and for the first uh, 15 years I was back from Vietnam, I had uh, significant problems with something called hypervigilance, which I suspect a number of the people on this uh, Zoom call know, know what hypervigilance is. And, and it was a, it reflected, uh, uh, it, it produced in me a desire to stay in my apartment and never go anywhere because when I went outside, it was as though someone hit me with a with a cattle prod. And uh, only over time did I learn to um, uh, manage that. And uh, if I had had some of the apps that are available today, I suspect it would have occurred much more quickly than it did. The um, apps for emotional self-regulation generally have uh, uh, exploded in terms of the numbers of them in, in the last uh, 10 years and have really exploded since the beginning of the pandemic. Um, there are apps that allow for the building of almost anything and which one you pick is a matter of, uh, of how you see the issues you're facing and experimenting, frankly, with uh, ways in which to uh, uh, manage specific emotions that are preventing you from living the kind of life that you want. Apps allow for the building of ritual and habit management of emotion, which is a, a key part of gaining self-regulation over feelings. And they also generally allow uh, an expansion of your personal understanding of the, of the emotionals and, and where they come from and, and how best for you to manage. All of them allow sharing, and some of them are tied to clinical support, and it's your choice whether you want to use clinical support or not. Some apps that support uh, emotional self-regulation include the Veterans Administration PTSD Coach app. There's a mobile version and an online version. 
And um, of the of the ones that are available, this is by far the best, and it would be the one I would start with if you want to get a sense of the things that apps can do regarding emotional self-regulation. And that the primary reason why it's so good is that it's been around for a while, and the VA has allowed actual people with actual veterans with PTSD to uh, uh, help with its development and um, it's, it's become a, a very good, very worthwhile thing to look at. There's a, if you are comfortable with the idea of cognitive behavioral therapy, there's a one called mind shift. Cognitive behavioral therapy, when it's controlled by the individual, I think is fine. I'm less um, comfortable with it when it's controlled by someone else. But uh, CBT is a worthwhile approach to managing uh, symptoms or barriers it, and uh, I think if, you, if you're interested in it, I would take a look at MindShift. If you have a substance use disorder problem, there are fewer alternatives, but there are some. And there's a, a 24 hours a day is probably the best known one and is worth looking at if you want to have something personal that you can use when you're uh, out there in the world and uh, you need some support right away. And I would... Uh, now, I, I won't try and explain to you that this is all there is. There's, uh, 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 I, to give you some examples, the CBT apps in general deal with symptoms like worry, panic, perfectionism, social anxiety, phobias, that kind of thing. Um, all those occur with anything. If you have a substance use disorder problem, you'll recognize all of those uh, uh, symptoms. And uh, so it's not, I think it's not worthwhile to get too stuck on how you frame your entrance into the use of the apps. What you're really after is finding one that helps you. And the only way I know of to do that is to try them out and see whether you think they're worth pursuing. Oops. I'm still getting a... The second area is supporting executive function. Executive functions are... In the in mental illness, substance use disorder, and and DD communities are often not thought of as uh, areas where there should be effort put in to support, but they are. Executive functions include focusing attention, working memory, planning, time management, the skills we associate with effective work. I mentioned at the beginning that uh, that if someone tells me something and I don't write it down that's likely to just disappear out of my brain. And um, I had a boss once, Liz Bauer, some of you may know her. Um, if, you, if you went in to Liz's office back in the old days and said to her, the, the building's on fire, she would nod her head. And if you turned around and walked out, nothing would happen. You had to write that down on a sheet of paper and put it in front of her. And if you did that, she would respond to it. People have a lot of those different kinds of of personal uh, quirks in executive functions and understanding those is the best first step to deciding how you want to expand your ability to use uh, your executive functions and the uh, in the outside world. Although I think most people are aware that when at teenage years and young adult years, they expand dramatically. And they can one of the one of the myths about them is, is that by the time you're 25, you're as good as you're ever going to get at them. And that's not true. They continue to improve for many decades. And the is, is that very young children, two and three year olds, are using the same parts of the brain that you would use for executive functions. They're just not doing the kinds of sophisticated uh, long-term attention, for example, or uh, time management. But if you've ever seen a three or four year old uh, focused on an activity um, for two hours straight. You, you can understand that it, attention is not just about uh, adults or adolescents. It's every, we all have issues with that and we all can use, we can change our attention to fit our needs at the time. It's well worth our while to do that. Um, Executive functions and ESR work together to expand personal recovery and social inclusion because emotional self-regulation is often necessary in order to uh, be able to use executive functions 
in a meaningful way for the goals that you have. Uh, gee, where did my, there it is. Um, executive functions, I'm going to talk about the most usable, but there are an awful lot of apps that support executive functions. The first one I'm going to mention is sticky notes. Um, I think most people know that sticky notes can be useful, but it, there's actually some fairly sophisticated ways to use sticky notes for large projects, even if they're entirely personal. And um, you can have sticky notes on your walls, you can have sticky notes on your computer, you can have sticky notes on your phone. Uh, sticky notes are generally useful to make sure that you don't lose something important between now and the time it's supposed to be done. Uh, the second group, and there's just so many of these that, uh, that uh, it's really important that you spend some time trying to decide the minimum size to-do list that you can actually use. Um, uh, Alexa, for example, allows you to, to list uh, shopping items and to-do items, and I found that I had no use for both lists, so I put everything on the, I tell Alexa, I put here, because well, Alexa is just... Yes. I'm sorry. I think you're breaking up a little bit. It's like kind of staticky. Um, oh, okay. I'm not sure what that is. Uh, uh, it looks like my signal's good from, am I still doing that? Um, a little bit. Um, I don't know if it's your mic or your connection. Um, or do you well, have like a, a headset that might work better? Oh, actually, yeah, it does sound better. Okay. And I just wanted to comment about the sticky notes. I have them on my computer and I have like a thousand of them in my office and I have Alexa and it's, I have to have so many reminders and I appreciate that. I'm excited to look at all those apps. There's a, a general thing that says that if you don't record the, what you want it to happen when you think of it, you're going to lose some. That's certainly true for me. So um, using Alexa or some other sticky note method is uh, an important part of of how I keep track of things. I have ADD, and and I've always had ADD. And uh, um, if I don't have some method of tracking very important things, I they don't get done. So and to do lists, they're fine as long as they're not so complicated that you they become a problem for your attention and your executive function in themselves. There's a bunch of very sophisticated ones. The third one, which is uh, in a, a, the alternative and, and augmentative communication systems have been around, I think I saw my first talking board in the, in the mid 70s. And it was created out of uh, a board with little uh, stickers on it that you could uh, use to indicate letters and commands. ACC is extremely important for individuals that um, need AC, AAC to talk. And I ran across a, a good one and I put it here because there's a zillion of them and uh, it's important that you pick one that actually matches your need. And of those that I have seen, this is the most flexible, but it's not cheap. It's like 180 bucks, but that's a one-time fee. A lot of the app based AACs require a subscription, and that can turn into an awful lot of money. Um, the last area that I want to talk about is personal safety. Uh, this is not an area that's typically uh, focused, the focus of AT for people with disabilities, even though personal safety is an important issue for everyone. Right now, personal safety is boils down to uh, uh, dealing with the pandemic, but there are many other issues in personal safety. I know that when I was uh, in the early years after I came back from Vietnam, I lived in some really terrible neighborhoods and I, I lived in some really terrible apartments because it was all I could afford. And uh, I was uh, homeless for a few months after I got back. And uh, during that time, I slept under the, for those of you who are familiar with MSU, I slept under the Bogue Street Bridge. 
uh, every night um, because it was summer and, and it was relatively safe. Someone had to, they wanted to get to me, they had to climb up a, a slope and, um, you know, it was protected from the rain and so on and so forth. So the notion of personal safety can be an important part of important barrier to people having the kind of life that they want. Um, I would note that personal safety is also an issue in the disability community because people use personal safety as an argument for taking away the control that people have over their lives. Uh, community mental health was notorious for this. I had not had the dealings with them. They would tell me if that's still an issue, though I would guess that it is. Um, family can decide that you shouldn't have control over your decision making. We've all sort of watched uh, Britney Spears get rid of her uh, her guardianship over the last year or so, and um, there's a general. A uh, trend which no individual ever accepts themselves, but that says that if we here in power decide that you can't be trusted to make the decisions we would make if we were in your position, then we have the right to take that control away from you. And so, uh, nonetheless, personal safety is an issue, and having apps that you control that help you maintain your personal safety is an important part of it, but not often talked about. In general, parental and authority-based models of imposing safety produce sabotage and rebellion, and they undermine personal autonomy and personal safety. When I worked at protection and advocacy, the, the effort to control the behavior of people with developmental disabilities using the guardianship system was sometimes uh, so ridiculous that um, it, it, there's the notion that parents and authority should be able to control all your behavior, which obviously they can't do. And um, the, the efforts to control behavior simply produced sabotage uh, uh, and risk-taking that undermined autonomy and personal safety. Personally motivated steps to ensure personal safety work best over the long term, and supporting that is what we should all be about. There's a, uh, a concept of uh, nat using natural supports to do uh, conversation and dialogue and problem solving to deal with personal safety issues. Um, I'm not saying that there's, that there's uh, uh, when, for example, when someone is, uh, uh, behaving in a way that's extremely dangerous to them. I don't have a big problem with somebody trying to stop that from happening in the short term, but those are not solutions for the long term. And frankly, the dangerous behavior and the use of drugs are the two biggest concerns of control systems, and they, they constitute the uh, kind of the larger uh, uh, social management system aside from prison and jail. And uh, so using an app to, to deal with issues that you already know are going to trigger uh, controlled responses from the larger environment is an important thing for you to embrace if, you, if you're comfortable doing it. Uh, there's some kind of, you know, ordinary sorts of things which include environmental alerts these days. Um, being able to know what your local weather is going to be, where you are right now, is an important part of being able to stay safe. And it's something for which there are many, many choices. I use something called Everbridge, which used to be called Nixle. It's free. It'll give you local alerts for a variety of safety-related problems, including weather ones. Also, accidents and uh, um, uh, when there's, uh, they use it for individuals who get lost, kids maybe uh, become lost and they use it for that. And they're free and easy to use and they're available for many counties, including Ingham, which is the one I live in. There are uh, best weather apps of 2021, which is an article that covers recent ones and is worth reviewing because it 
talks about the what they do well and what they don't do well. There is a, uh, a set of personal safety apps, which includes a wide variety of things. And these have arisen in large measure because uh, of women that are facing abusive uh, partners and uh, need help with protecting protection from that. And I would, uh, I would suggest that everyone needs to review these because although I don't, I don't think there's anybody out to get me right now, there is not, it is the truth that when I was in other uh, jobs working in crisis intervention centers, or I was, I was working with individuals in the substance use disorder arena. I had, uh, I was the, I was the youngest substance abuse therapist, and so I had everyone who was court ordered for um, substance abuse therapy, which uh, included individuals who were genuinely dangerous. And I needed to have a barrier between my personal life outside of the office and those individuals. And there were no apps back then, but I took other steps like not having my phone number uh, in the phone book and those kinds of things. And there are equivalents of those for maintaining safety today. I also put in an article that said that using a personal safety app doesn't make you paranoid. There is, it isn't a question of whether uh, as, as, is always the case with anxiety. It's not a question of whether uh, um, you're accurate. That's your decision to make. It's a question of whether you can mitigate the anxiety by having something that uh, that permits you to not think about those possibilities when you're in situations that uh, 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 where you want to be having a good time, for example. Um, I think that personal safety is the undeveloped part of, uh, of uh, the use of apps for the kinds of topics that we have been talking about today. And I think it's, if any of you are into creating apps, it's something I would suggest you take a look at because uh, uh, personal safety, uh, dealing with trolls, uh, um, scams and other things are largely there, certainly everyone gets that they're issues, but they, they're largely not accessible responses to those kinds of things. And I would, uh, in speaking of individuals with developmental disabilities, for example, I've noted, for example, that um, the mainstream substance use disorder system is really not capable of supporting individuals with developmental disabilities well. And they, and uh, the tendency, if you're a person with a developmental disability, or for that matter, any kind of cognitive disability, including autism, to try to get useful support from uh, the mainstream SUD system is tough because it's really not organized around uh, your needs for support. When I was in the 80s, that, those issues were... Uh, AA not accepting people with mental illness diagnoses as part of their groups. It was, uh, and that included people with uh, cognitive disabilities weren't allowed to participate in uh, mutual support groups that focused on uh, substance abuse. Uh, programs that were residential wouldn't allow or were incredibly ineffective in supporting people with developmental disabilities or uh, neurotypical, neuro, uh, atypical. Uh, neurotypes, uh, these things haven't changed much. So it's worth, even if uh, they are more open, which they are now, the, it's worth having some stuff that reflects your understanding of your personal safety. Um, I'm sure there are people here who are familiar. This is not something that is just popped up since the internet. There was a concept in AA groups called uh, 13th Stepping which was about um, manipulating and gaslighting members of the AA group for personal gain. And uh, that's been there since there were mutual support groups. Personal safety is something that needs more attention and more time and apps that actually are responsive to the needs of people with disabilities, regardless of type. So um, to sum up, one of the things that is uh, uh, we've 
been raised and taught that our society is supposed to provide solutions for us, but no technology ever solves a human problem. We have to think of them as tools, not as uh, um, solutions. You know, solutions is, it makes you passive. It means that you don't grapple with and engage with the things that are preventing you from living the life that you want. Tools allows you to engage and it's uh, apps are an important way that we can engage with issues and learn about our the things that we see as being barriers to our lives being freer and, and having more choices. The technology is a scaffold. When a person uses an app, they're engaged in a support ecosystem and uh, that ecosystem exists no matter why you got involved in it. And it's important that you know what that ecosystem is, that it isn't, the app isn't just there to solve your problem, it's doing other things. And you should try to build an understanding of what the ecosystem for that app is. The VA's PTSD app, for example, has a huge uh, ecosystem out there. And it's been used in, a, as you'll see, if you go to the website and take a look at the app and try it out for yourself, there, there are an, an enormous number of communities, not just veterans, who can make use of that in recognition that we, we need to have uh, trauma-informed apps, not just apps. There are always more possibilities out there than you know, and some of them are good possibilities and some of them aren't. The, the final thing is, is that no matter how lonely you feel right now or how isolated you feel, there are a bunch of people out there trying to solve similar problems to your own. And uh, the use of apps is one way to find those people. And they have uh, the advantage uh, that if you find that it's not actually working for you, you can just uninstall it. And that's a great help uh, in trying to find solutions that actually fit your situation. All right, um, I'd like to talk a bit about the MDRC's assistive technology program because it goes well beyond um, uh, what I've described to you today in terms of apps. And uh, one of the things I know personally is that um, there are important uh, pieces, even though my background is a, a, a lifelong problem with severe depression and PTSD, I know that you can actually have more than one disability at a time. And uh, for example, I have a, um, what's called a fine motor apraxia, which means that I can't uh, use my fingers very well in detailed um, activity. It's, it has meant in kind of the real world before I began to understand the meaning of uh, of uh, personal agency and disability, it meant that I couldn't learn an instrument because I could never be even mediocre at it because of this fine motor apraxia. Um, and that had implications for the life that I was living, especially when I was an adolescent. Most of my friends, close friends, were musicians. I couldn't participate in that effectively. Um, there are any disability can uh, make it harder for you to make choices and and uh, to express personal agency in a particular area. And so the MDRC AT program doesn't make any particular focus about the, the universe of AT. And one of the best ways in which we try to personalize and support personal choice is through the use of assistive technology demonstrations. These demonstrations, uh, if you know what area you wanna look for some help with, you can uh, use one of the demonstrations to help you choose between alternative devices or apps that support your choices. And uh, we do a lot of these and um, we wanna do more. And you can use the link to look at the MDRC's AT demonstration program. And you can fill out an application for an AT demonstration. And it really can be about just about anything. <laughs> 
and we're always trying to expand um, the availability of demonstrations in different parts of life. Right now, we're beginning a project uh, to include uh, art as a MDRC AT demonstration. And we have recently added a very sophisticated program on demonstrations around uh, recreational activities, which are an important part of uh, any person's life and shouldn't be restricted just because you happen to have a disability. Um, oops. So I would, I would take a look at those materials and see whether anything strikes your fancy, especially if you've had a chance to look at the, at the resource page. This is my information. Um, there's uh, some of it is uh, directly related to the AT uh, program, including the AT blog. And um, I also have some blogs that I have been running for a long time. One is on how you change complex systems. Uh, there, and I do postings of scanned articles because I, I scan for stuff anyway. It's, it's part of my, uh, my symptomology on the autism spectrum. I scan for information because, you know, if I just had enough information, then I would be able to solve every single problem in the universe. And I can't stop that. I do it anyway. So I try to express those, uh, that uh, uncontrollable uh, compulsion of mine in in, a, in two blogs. One is called the Disability Cosmos, and it's just general items. And then the other one is Michigan Voices for Better Health, which grew out of a project that MDRC had um, several years ago. And, um, you're welcome to sign up for those. I post something almost every day. And um, you don't have to read all the items. You can just look at the headline. If it looks interesting, you can read it. And if, you, if it doesn't look interesting, you can ignore it. All right, I have uh, put together um, some links in the, in the notes that uh, are probably more formal than most people would want to ever go through. But if you're, if you're interested in them, the best one of the lot is called Self-Regulation Through Assistive Technology. And it's the first one in the notes. Um, it's, uh, those are all in the resource uh page so th there's a a general uh general capability in mdrc's at resources which are extremely extensive and uh i would add something called the job accommodation network because it is easily the best national information source on actual accommodations and apps that you can actually use and it's not although it says job accommodation which is how it started jan is a is available for accommodations for just about anything. And it's worth using if you have something fairly specific that you're looking for and you're not sure um, uh, what you should focus on or what you should use. They also have great videos and uh, podcasts and other things about highly specific topics. So if you're looking for, for example, if you're looking for emotional regulation uh, accommodations, for a specific work environment, I would look on Jan. If you have a, a disability that is uh, progressive, I would look on Jan. If you have something that you want to deal with that's extremely specific and you think no one in the world could possibly have a solution for it, the first place I'd look is the Job Accommodation Network. Um, let's see. All right, is if there are any questions, I don't know if there are, but if there are any, um, I'd be happy to try to answer them now. I've got, I don't know, eight or nine minutes left. Um, if uh, not, you can put them in the chat with your email address and I'll respond to you there. Uh, this is something that I have thought was uh, lacking in the larger disability community's approach to social justice. And I've been really happy to see that over the last decade, there's been a significant recognition of one, how trauma produces uh, uh, disability, um, not just physical disability, but disability in the way in which we deal with the world around us. 
And the second thing is, is the recognition that recovery can uh, be trauma informed and that it can result in, I'll just tell you an anecdote because I think it's an interesting uh, capsule expression of why recovery is an important concept for our communities. I, you know, some years ago, I went through the peer support specialist training and that, that's done, that was done at the time at a place up north of Clare, uh, some kind of state facility whose name escapes me right now. And uh, 30 people would go up there and we would go through five days of training and exercises and discussion and so on to get uh, ready for testing uh, to be a peer support specialist. And one morning we all came uh, down to the uh, learning arena in which we were sitting down in there and um, four women who had bunked together the night before talked about a conversation they had at breakfast. And one of them, one of the women had uh, woken up as happened to her on occasion with uh, voices, which wouldn't shut up when she woke up and got moving around. And uh, instead of trying to hide it, she brought it up because I think she felt comfortable with the support network that we had at the Pearson Society. And they engaged, the four of them engaged in conversations about how they dealt with voices, about uh, things that they had tried. And by the time she got to the training, the voices had shut up. And she didn't do anything special to try and have that happen. It resulted as, as a direct result of trying to solve a problem with other people who understood what her experience was and uh, were willing to listen for what she had to say about it and were willing to support uh, her in doing something, trying to find something without dictating solutions and without telling her that she needed to see a psychiatrist or that she needed to be on medication. And to me, that encapsulates the best of mutual support and recovery, and to the extent that apps can, can do that, can actually contribute to that, they are an important part of, of everything that we do as, a, as socially justice-oriented disability advocates. So if there are any, uh, uh, are any questions, I'd be glad to answer them, but if not, I would ask that the next time you use your smartphone, you think this is assistive technology and not just that this is a way to make a call or to play a game or uh, to do other things. Any questions? Mm -hmm. um, it doesn't look like there's any questions. There are a few comments though. Okay. Um, Melissa says, thank you so much for sharing this with us, Norm, very helpful. And on Facebook, normally I don't, um, cover the Facebook live, but I happen to be overachieving today. And Maria on Facebook says, love the robust list of resources. Thank you for sharing your personal experience as well, Norm. This has been very engaging. And Sonia says, thank you for sharing. All right, great. I appreciate the opportunity. This is something of genuine and personal and personal importance to me. And so I'm happy to get a chance to talk about it. So I want to thank all of you for participating. Yes, thank you everyone for joining us. And Norm, I have to say when you're talking about the links, um, so just so everyone knows, um, every other Tuesday we have a staff meeting and Norm likes to send out before the staff meeting um, a, but a list of some of the resources. He found all the links and that's like my favorite part of the day. I love, I'm like, give me all the links. I love it so much. She always has such interesting <laughs> articles, like educational, and there's a miscellaneous section that has a lot of fun things, like I'll find stuff on stuff from the UP and entomology and museums and art. And like, it's just so awesome. We love Norm. <laughs> well, you, as a, I would say that, it, that your compulsions can be a, a ticket to a, a future of use to everyone. So. <laughs> All right. All right. Well, Thanks. thank you again, everyone, for joining us. Thank you, Norm, thank so you. much. I hope everyone has a great day. And just letting you know, there will be a survey that pops up at the end once you exit. And if you could take that, it'd be super helpful. Um, and yes, thank you so much. Cool. Awesome there it is. Job. Bye.